Craig Field, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. Mate, thanks for having me. Really appreciate you giving me your time, mate. I mean, uh, I was going through some of your stats before, mate. You know, you've had a pretty hell of a um, career. You know, you played 180 odd um, first grade games, and you started um, debut at 17 for South Sydney. Um, you know, when you look back on your career, what do you take? What have you taken from your career that's turned you into the person that you are today? Well, a lot of the things, mate. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and I was grateful that um, I got the opportunities I did. And uh, rugby league's been part of my life since I was four years old. So, uh, you know, like it's um, it's a boy, boy, boy dream when you, you know, schoolboy dream. And you know, as a young fellow, I always wanted to play rugby league. And and I uh, know I had that chance, and I and, and I'm honoured to to have done the things I've done. And and um, you know, there's a few things that we we we, we won't you know, say that I'm that proud of, but, um, you know, you make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes and that makes the person you are. But when it comes to rugby league, I was very grateful and, um, and I, I really enjoyed my time and unfortunately it was cut short, but, but, um, having them opportunities and some of the milestones I did get, um, I'm very honored and privileged about. Yeah, definitely, mate. Um, you play 84 games for South, uh, start back in 1990 in the first grade arena. Um, you move on to Manly, uh, Belmain, and then when they um, merged with West, uh, West Sub- Western Suburbs um, over here in Australia, then you, I think it was you went over to France to play um, as well. Um, yeah, that's correct. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Um, when I ever played in Perpignan, where the, um, the actual Super League team, Perpignan, the UT, um, that's the cat line now. That's, uh, that's oh, yep. the, the area. Um, and uh, you know it's 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 growing and growing over there. So it's um it's great that I was actually there when it was probably just you know just a, it's a local A grade competition or a first grade competition, and uh, it's kicked on. And it's great to see that um, people that put so much hard work in around the area have um, reaped the rewards having a Super League team. Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Um, with your South career, um, you, like I said, you debuted at seventeen. How was it for you? Uh, oh, I don't know if you supported them as a kid, but you debuting at 17 for one of the foundation clubs of um, you know, what's now known as the NRL. How was that for you? Oh, mate, it was obviously awesome. And, um, you know, I was starstruck myself. You know, I, I remember going to South after, you know, being an East junior and going to South and, and um, you know, East told me I was too small and then South gave me the opportunity. And then just to train with the players that play for South Sydney. And then they were like, you know, they were minor premiers in uh, 89, even though they had a bad run at the end in the semifinals against Canberra. But the players and the calibre they had and, and George Piggins being the coach and just so many players that I, I look to as, you know, as mentors, as um, rugby league players that were playing then. And to have that opportunity, it was just um, a dream come true. And, you know, was I ready, ready for it? Probably not. Um, injury to Craig Coleman probably give me the opportunity and um, I, I'm grateful for it and you know it was like a, it was like a learning curve and, and to have that chance to play with them players I talked about um, oh, it's, it's amazing yeah absolutely um, you know I can only imagine you yourself coming in as a 17 year old what it would be like you know with all those names that you mentioned um, playing there um, but your, your career like you play 84 games to South um, and then you move on to Manly um, when you when you went to Manly, um, you were, would have already known, um, you know, Jeff Tuvey and Cliffy Lyons already there in the halves. How was that decision sort of made for you, or how did you make that decision um, to go to Manly, being knowing that you're going to be behind those two halfbacks? Well, it all started uh, back in 90, 96 and um, South were struggling, and they were going to lose the Leeds club, and there was Alan Jones, who was our CEO. Had a few meetings with him and I was captain of the club at the time and I wanted to stay at South. I had no ambitions to leave South Sydney and I'll make that clear in, in the book that I'm writing. And um, anyway, uh, I was told that the club was going to fold and, um, you know, it wasn't a cup, wasn't straight away that they did, but a couple of years later they did. So, um, um, you know, and at that time I was speaking to my manager, Wayne Beavis, and there was a lot of interest in other clubs and, um, when it come to Manly, you know, I had a meeting with Bob Fulton and I was told, and again, this is in my book, that I was told by Bob that um, Cliffy Lyon was going to retire. And I'd already known that Cliffy was probably one of the best 5'8s that um, 
the plate that, that wore the number six jersey in in the ARL or the NRL. And um, and to me, I had no idea because I didn't know Cliffy beforehand whether he was going to retire. Did I think he, he should retire? Probably not. But I was told that, and, I, and that's the reason I was going there to play in the halves with Jeff Tooby. So it was the decision that, A, I was going to get coached by the Australian coach, and two, that there was a position me and I wasn't going to have to go there through what I did go through, you know, trying to, um, you know, try and take a position off a player that's one of the greatest players to play the game. And, and because I was thinking he was going to retire. So, um, you know, what we, we're great mates. And, and, and until this day, we're still friends, you know, Jeff and, and, and Cliffy. Um, and, and, you know, it was a bit of a rough patch for me there going there, even though it was just an honour to play with the players I played with the calibre. Um, and that was just a great area to live in at the time. Uh, moving from South Sydney over to the Northern Beaches and um, made so many good friends. And it was a great club, um, even though, you know, I might have seen eye to eye with a few individuals there in the hierarchy. Um, you know, as, as a player that sort of just come from, you know, growing up on the streets and then going to Northern Beaches, which is a club that's very interlocked with themselves. And, um, you know, you've got two of the greatest players that have played in that in their jerseys in Jeff Tooby and Cliff Lyon. So I, I could understand the scrutiny that I was sort of under. But, um, you know, I don't think that the honest the honest stories were told about it, you know. And even going back to that, mate, like I, I made a decision to go there for a lot of reasons for myself. But, um, I mean, I had other off- offers. And if I would have known the truth, maybe in hindsight, I, I might have might have went there and put that pressure on myself to try and compete with the players I had to when I was told they weren't going to be there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because when you first went to Manly, that was around the time that the Super League and that was um, it was happening too. How, how do you remember that time of, um, you know, that, I guess, um, shitstorm of, of an era with the well, ARL and the Super League getting sort of split apart? Yeah, well, it was really tough, mate, because, you know, you being over in Australia, it was very tough because, you know, you had all these um, opportunities that they were trying to grow the game. And, and like, like even in today, you know, like there's all these different things that maybe it didn't work or did work, but they're still trying things and there's still a lot of scrutiny and a lot of inconsistencies. And I think just back then, I think the hindsight of it to make the game bigger was probably a good idea. How they went about it, I don't know whether the truth was that they did it the right way. But as a player, you know, my... My, my loyalty was at South Sydney at the time. And then when I was told what I was told, um, that the club's going to fold, the Leeds club, selling the Leeds club. And, you know, it was more or less a bit like what happened to Bow Main Tigers um, and to a couple other, you know, like Western Suburbs, you know, St. George, you know, I mean, St. George and Lawara still together, but Lawara got kicked out. So, you know, like it was a really tough time because, um, you know, with Super League, a lot of things and a lot of turn a lot of people off and a lot of my friends and the blokes I went to school with as kids and their parents, they, they all swore they'd never watch rugby league again because of what was going on. But I don't think the consistency and the truth come out about how what the what the whole the whole goal about it was. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, um, even in today, like even in something today when I got home from work, I seen something on the news about how the players are, you know, over there concentrating the Australian team to play in the in the World Cup, in the finals, the semis, and you know the lead, and the the two bosses are staying back in Australia, not going over because they're trying to fix some play disputes or or other issues that are going on. This has been going on from day dot. And when I was first coming through the grades, when I wasn't on no dollars at all, and that's the way it was, used to work and play. Um, you know, the money was going somewhere, and um, and I think that's the biggest hardest part that business people realise that with the ARL that certain money wasn't getting handed out or there was an avenue where the players could get more money and then that's still someone like Rupert Murdoch or someone like that in the TV rights would still make money. And I think that opened a lot of people's eyes inside regularly. Not so much the supporters because supporters just want to see their players play. They want to keep, keep their clubs going. And that's where it broke the game apart because um, the big picture wasn't really told and explained the way what was going on. But... I think there was a lot of lot of things that people have realised, and and even till this day, it's still going on. That yeah. um, I mean, while players are getting paid an exceptional amount of money, but um, it's, it's it's at the end of the day when you go on the on a on a global global stroke, they're not getting paid that much when you you go to like the best sports in the world. So if we want to think we've got one of the best products in the game of, of sport, 
you know, we've got to pay the players accordingly. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, I think, um, yeah, I've talked to a few people about it as well. You know, I think what the Super League did was it made the ARL realise um, how much they were, I guess, not paying the players and the play, and they needed these players to make the brand, make their product. Um, and it made the game, I think, I think it turned the game into um, a more professional outfit. Whereas, like you said, you guys were tra- having to go to work and then go to training and, and play. Whereas nowadays, that's their full-time job is, is training and playing and, you know, they don't actually have a job outside of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, they do, they do a lot of things better than they than they did back when I come through. But, I mean, you never stop learning. And I think that, you know, the, like, the young guys are still getting their opportunities to do diplomas or doing some yeah. degree that they have life after football, which I think is very important because I can tell you now, and I can honestly say that, and again, I keep mentioning about my book, but I do believe I've got a good story to tell. And, and a lot of people don't talk about it. And I don't talk about my book about me being a rugby league player, about how good I was or whatever, but I actually just tell scenarios about things that haven't been told. And that's one of them that, you know, when I was coming through, blokes working on, on the council as Garbos, or they'll, they'll, trying to do trades or they were just labourers and then they'd work and then they'd train and then they'd play. I mean, it was a great game when I played. I remember, you know, having all three grades and the clubs were so united and and it was really enjoyable to play in that in that era. And I'm blessed that I, well, I did that. But when you talk about the dollars that are involved from the TVs and um, Channel 9 and uh, Fox and all that sort of stuff that come on board, you know, like there's so much money there and like, I, I just don't understand, like, you know, and um, how that they don't, they didn't do it earlier. And um, and then people have a lot to answer for it because if they had been doing it properly and they had looked at the, the market and the, the game where, where we we're going to go, you wouldn't have someone like a businessman like Rupert Murdoch try and sabotage or whatever way you want to say it, take over. Because I do believe that the game should be bigger the game, this game should be beat. We should have more more football in Western Australia. Um, in in, in a real team, we should have one in Adelaide. We should have one in you know we've got one in Melbourne that's been so successful. Look yep. at Melbourne the yep. last twenty years, you know. So I think that at the end of the day, that's just, that's a proof in the pudding that if you have someone like Melbourne that's been in the competition for what I don't know twenty years is it since oh, ninety nine ninety eight I'm pretty sure ninety eight and how successful yeah. have they been? Then what what would you say that Western Australia or or South Australia or it doesn't matter, you know. Like the North Queens are up there, and they've they've played it with one of Grand Prem, Premiership. Yeah, it's what you what you give the opportunity and how you market it, and then all of a sudden you don't just you don't just kill it kill it off because it doesn't appease one or two people. You know, I think that at the end of the day, if they if they want to market the game to being the best game in the country, then that's what we have to do. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um. So yeah, once you've um you. You got over to Manly, mate. You played um, 50-odd games for them. Um, you go over to Balmain, the 99 season, um, and then you were there when Balmain and Western Suburbs merged. How was that um, for you, um, you know, being coming in with, I guess, the two clubs joining together? How did you find that sort of transition? Well, first of all, like when I left Manly, it was very tough because of um, – at the end of the day, I just and it comes down to um, that the Bozo and I weren't seeing eye to eye, so I, I moved on, and um, and I think it was a great thing because at the end of the day, that you know him him he he, he never once said that I wasn't quite what good enough to play first grade, but because of a few things that I'd said regarding uh, his family members that were playing first grade and stuff like that, um, was just my opinion, and and you know what I regret some of the things I said. But at the end of the day, I spoke from the heart. I wear my heart in my sleeve. So at the end of the day, when I said things, you know, he didn't like to hear it. And then the day, as a father, I respect that immensely. But um, when it when it pushed come to shove, I went to Balmain. And if you do recall that game, the week after I left Manly, we played Bal- Balmain, played Manly, and we won. So Balmain won, and Balmain were down. So to me, it was like it was it was like something that that not like an ego thing, but the thing is, it proved that my football was still there. Yeah. But um, um, you know, opinions weren't. So for me, I moved on and I have got lots of friends in Manly and I do appreciate the opportunity to be at Manly. Did it work? No, it didn't. Um, everybody will, will understand the reasons why and and people don't. I'm, did I play my best when I tried to? Did I, did I ever try not to play good for Manly? Never. I did my best every time I get there. Did I play good all the time? Not all the time. 
because of situations and uh, the press that it all sort of put on. Maybe I didn't handle it, you know. But um, to go to Balmain for Manly, I think it was a good thing for me. I really enjoyed the opportunity to play for another club like, you know, Balmain and South, the traditional clubs, and and um, and, and, and played 17 games there and ended up winning the best and fairest. So to me, it was a real satisfying year, having the opportunity of Wayne Pierce to give me a, uh, the chance to come over there and play. And and then and to, to, to then go into the Merge Club, being the first halfback ever to play for West Tigers, again, it's a great honour. Yep. Um, two two great clubs for many of years of rugby league uh, merged together. Um, do I do I look back now and look at it, you know, and say, well, I agree with the merger? No, I don't, because I think there's enough room for both of them. Yep. But in saying that too, um, you know, it's not my decision to make that one. But but I I was definitely honoured to play for West Tigers. Um, Probably just a few things on the field. I let myself down, so I take full responsibility of that. But to have that opportunity, and there's certain things that people can't take away, and to wear that number seven for the first time in that first emerged club, um, it was a great, you know, it was a great honour. And I, I honestly believe, and I look back at today. I know they won 2005, and I yeah. think they got into another maybe grand final or semi-finals, and they got knocked out. Yeah. But, but I think that. Um, I don't think a lot of the cultures change there, and I think that's yeah. reflecting on their performances. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's been a bit of a um, a hard time from the last couple of years. They've uh, they've gone from being competitive um, down. I think um, you know they've uh, like because I watch what a lot of the NRL three hundred and sixty and all of these sort of shows. It seems that the the head office is is doing different something different to. Um, the, the coaching staff and the players and the and it's just making it hard on the coaches because they don't know their future. Um, and then, you know, it didn't help with, um, you know, the Ivan Cleary situation. He went there and he must have just seen what was going to happen. He went, no, nah, I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, he you're right. I, think, I, I think you're exactly right, mate, because, I mean, look at the success that gentleman's had and, and I know why pretty good. And, uh, and you know, like, it's, it's simple because you go there and you see what's going on and he thought that, you know, there was more opportunity somewhere else and he'd been at Pender from come there and went back and, 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 and other players I know that have been there. I mean, I don't think the players aren't trying that are there, but I just find, I just got a message from uh, Robbie O'Davis, the great yeah. Newcastle <laughs> Newcastle fullback. But anyway, um, but in saying that, so I just think there's so many. And, and for me, if you had a business and I had to turn over staff all the time, there's something going on with the business. And I think that at the end of the day, you break things down is pretty simple in life. And I think the board's changed at least three or four times to my knowledge. Um, yeah. They've had different coaches, and I think Madge is a great coach. He's one of them. But I, I just think at the end of the day, um, you know, if, I, if I'm running a business that's, you know, got no, not, not the, the um, equipment I need to run, and I'm not going to do a good job. And and I think at the end of the day, and that comes back to the people that are making the decisions. And, and you know, I could be critical and people might think that it's a bit too much, but the proof's in the pudding again. Um, they haven't been successful for a long time. I think Tim Sheen's got great knowledge and he's a great, great man. Um, and I hope things turn around for him because I really like him as a human being. But yeah. um, I just think that, um, uh, you know, like you've ever got the players, I, I don't know, mate. I really don't. I think they're in for a lot of tough year. I think, I think with Team Sheens coming there, um, he's going to instill some culture into these boys, into the club again with the players. Um, there's still some standards, and he's going to, you know, he's got uh, Benji Marshall and Robbie Faber coming through to take over when he, um, you know, does hang up, hang up the boots or hangs up the uh, the clipboard, you know. So these guys are going to keep that culture coming through. So I think the future. Is there just the Tigers fans have got to be patient with it? That's just my opinion, obviously, but yeah. I think they're just got to be patient with it. I, th- I think you're right. I think you're right in so many aspects, but I just think that there's been a lot of uh, drums in the past that have yeah. have hurt the club and they've never got onto it. But I really think, and I agree with you, what you're saying there is that you get two legends that play for the club in Benji and, and Robbie, and then you get someone that's a mastermind coach that's been so successful in our game. And I think you know what it's only going to be upwards and forwards for them. But, but in saying that too, they're starting, they're starting from somewhere where people have not made the right decisions for a long time in key positions, and it's hurt the club. Yeah. Now they come from two areas where there's rugby league heartlands. Uh, West probably a bit bigger, and I think that there's so much talent out there. Yeah. And rather than losing them to someone else, 
obviously they've got structures in place and they've got you know they've got people that are scouting and and all over the place. But I I I, I know they've got some couple of good junior teams coming through. I just hope that they're smart enough to use these quality people that are now coaching and and in part in future going to be the coaching. I hope that they put them and give them the opportunity to have these stars coming through. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, the one thing that they need to do, they need to make a decision whether they want to keep or get rid of Luke Brooks. I mean, you being a halfback yourself, um, you know, he's under immense pressure there and he's been the face of that club, the solid the solid point in that club for a long time now. You know, Robbie Farrow has gone, come back, Benji come back, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and he's been the whipping boy. Um, but I think they need to make a decision. You know, they either need to let him go and, you know, thank him for his service or they need to keep him and stick by him and, and show the faith in him. I think you did two keys there. He either goes and does the best thing for Luke Brooks. Luke Brooks can play, 100% he can play. And he proved that last year a couple of times when he moved, all right, they might have put him in six and then he was in seven. And irrespective, at the end of the day, is the pressure was totally different. And he's been put under so much scrutiny since they've lost the players. Now, look, as I go back to this, and I say this sincerely, not attacking anyone, but you've lost Mitchell Moses, you lost Teddy Disco, you keep Brooks. Now, there's a three, there's a spine that everybody was talking about when you had a Melbourne Storm with Billy Slater, Cooper Cron, you know what I mean? You've got players like that in the spine. I mean, everyone started copying it, and that's what they're doing regularly. They all copy. There was a Benji Marshall. So all of a sudden, everyone signed up a Kiwi. It was the, the, the Tullamaho uh, from Tullamaho from uh, North Queensland. Everybody wants to get a Tonga player now. I mean, that's the phases regularly go through, unfortunately, when they've got talent scouts. Talent yep. scouts, honestly, are seriously just like you and I have an opinion. But you know the problem is some get paid, but they don't get sacked. They're like the weathermen. They don't get anything wrong. So that's as gross, it's a real hard point for me when it comes to that because here's a player like Luke Brooks, right, who when the team goes bad, he gets blamed for it. And I think, I'm not saying he played outstanding week in, week out, but the blokes, the bloke can play. And they didn't give him much much to work with when they started losing all their quality players and they started buying players that were on their way out or really were just not in good form at other clubs because they had to sign someone that actually played at one or two quality clubs. And yeah. at the end of the day, you, you know, this is what this conversation is always about, whether I'm right or wrong, but it, it's my opinion. And I think that, He's been a bit of a scapegoat. And I think that at the end of the day, if you look at the Gold Coast Titans, you look at another player, a kid come in at the halfbacks last year, and they were going to say, oh, he's going to stick with him, blah, blah, blah. They chewed him up and spat him out. Then he's back yeah. playing seagulls. You know, like, I just think that these days, that they've got a lot to answer for regular league teams, yeah. and they've got to start sticking, sticking with what they've got. You know, and if they do that, I think at the end of, at the, end of the day, if they, if they thought the play, if, if, a coach, if a coach, and I've always coached, and I've coached in lower grades, and I've coached in captain coached many a teams, and been successful too, and I think then they, if you think that that one player is good enough from your first opinion, why all of a sudden does he not? Okay, you lose form, but at the end of the day, he was the best you had to start with. Yeah. So in that season, unless you recruit someone from somewhere outside, he's still the best you got, because that was your decision to get him there. And I think at the end of the day, the people, when they start, a little bit of pressure gets on coaches, they start to take, take it out on one or two players. And unfortunately, that's the halfback. Yep. Yep. And we've seen it so many times with other people, um, you know, especially in the last few years, you know, Mitchell Pierce being one, um, Tom Dearden at the Broncos, um, yep. you know, and there's, there's plenty of other ones that and, we can and name. What, but... what, and what a, what a year, what a year that Tom Dearden had. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, wow. Exactly. Okay. Broncos were a bit of confidence and what happened was going on. Maybe it was maybe it wasn't so much confidence. Maybe there was just some internal stuff going on. And any any I sort of thought, well, has this kid got it? You know, he must be doing something right because he's there. Uh, you know, not a muggy if you're playing first grade. And and what a, what a super year. And I think maybe going back to what we're talking about with Lee Brooks, if he goes somewhere else, maybe he might come out and win the Dally M. Who yeah. knows? You know yeah. what I mean? Like sometimes a change is as good as a holiday and. And I think at the end of the day, it worked for Tom Dearden. And I think that's a classic example. But I also have seen other clubs, you know, and I'm, I'm, I've been one of them myself to go from, you know, being successful at South, you know, one of their top five players, and all of a sudden go to Manly where you're playing with superstars. And, you, you know, you've you, you just got to learn to play play with other players because 
it's a different totally then when you're playing with a team that's getting beaten all of a sudden you play with a team that you're winning. Uh, you've got to change your game and, and it's, it's all about learning. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I could go on for ages about that, so we'll, um, <laughs> we'll jump subjects now. Um, but have you got any advice for young kids coming up to the, these days? Um, you know, whether it be to do with uh, rugby league or um, just life in general, mate, have you got any advice for these kids? 100% I have. I mean, like I said, uh, every, everybody knows that I've made a few tr- bad choices and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of them. But at the end of the day, it builds the character you are. I never did anything that I thought that I was hurting someone else. I was always probably hurting myself for my own demons. But, um, you know, we, when it comes to, like, talking to your kids or, or giving advice, I think it's quite simple. I think, you know what, you should always communicate. And, you know what, if you're thinking something, always ask questions and talk. And um, always look to the people that you, you respect the most. And that's obviously your parents. But when it comes to rugby league, at the end of the day, you've got to be responsible for what you do and what you, what decisions you make. And at the end of the day, if you're going to be a first grader, you've got to commit yourself. And if I had my time again, I'd commit myself for as long as I could rugby play and be as fit as I could be. And I wouldn't worry about all the other things on the outside because, you know, I got caught up on that sort of thing where, you know, you get put in the paper, you're getting people that want your time, you've got people that want to know you. And, and a lot of them have different agendas. And um, you're not built, you're not known, you're not really taught how to, you know, react to that. But yep. that's why I say I think now the game's got better in that area. And I think, yep. you know, you should always have something to fall back from behind rugby league. But I think at the end of the day, you should always like, um, you know, set some goals and and then and, and I didn't have that sort of thing. And I and I, I love my parents very dearly, but I didn't have the parents that they just let me do whatever I, you know, let me control my I, I did everything on my own, you know. I never had someone telling me what I had to do with my money or or yeah. with my lifestyle. And um and I think at the end of the day is that I while I take responsibility, but a bit of guidance sometimes goes a long way. And I think with the mentoring and the teaching and all that stuff now, and even today, let's not kid ourselves, people are still making, and they're human, still making errors and making poor judgments. And I think that's got to do with some people that are in the outskirts, you know, that haven't got their best agenda at heart or, yeah. you know, their best world. So my, my best advice really, mate, is um, that at the end of the day, be man up, man up for yourself, set some goals, whether if, whether if it be drinking, gambling, um, socialising, out, you know, chasing girls, whatever it is, you need to make the commitment. If you want to be the best in, in what you're doing, you're getting you get a hell of a career out of, and life out of rugby league, you've got to make the most of it and you've got to make sacrifices. And, and I honestly believe the best people in the game are the ones that do that. Um, yeah. And I also have an opinion on the flip side of that, that, that a lot of the best, best, best human beings are the ones out there telling people how, what to do. Well, I agree. Tell them what you've done because you've done it great. But the thing is, you've got to make mistakes sometimes to learn some hard things, and to yeah. also learn, you know, um, you know, learn to be able to give advice because, you know, in a lot of the a lot of the clubs now, you know, they they got all these welfare officers and that, and all these people. They're probably entitled to be in that position, but are they really the ones? Even the ambassadors, while they should be ambassadors to the game because they've done nothing but good for the game, but are they the ones that should be talking to the twenty year olds about? When this bloke comes and taps you on the shoulder or this bloke says, I don't like club, I want you to start coming here or, you know what I mean, you start winning up people, they're not going to know the what answers. I think that's where in life and even outside of sport, the kids today, you know, they, there's a lot of opportunities of, 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 you know, walking down the wrong path. And, and I just think that mentoring and I think that, that communication is the biggest thing about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, mate. And that is absolutely perfect advice. Um, for any of the kids um, watching this, mate. So thank you for that. Really appreciate that because um, I've got I've got ten kids at home myself. So um, yeah, I, I I show my kids my my videos and hope that they take something in from everyone that I talk to. So no, I really appreciate that. I think that's great, um, mate. Because you know what? I think at the end of the day, um, no no one writes the book on how to be a father or or. But you know what? We all try to be good people. And sometimes, you know, like you, you make split decisions. And, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, there's no one on this planet that knows it more than me. And, and that's why I try to stress in my book that um, is that, you know, one decision can change your life forever. And that doesn't mean you need to be pressure, 
put pressure on yourself to live in a bubble. But the thing is, you've also got to you got to you got to set some goals. And if you set some goals, and I think that when you do come across a situation where you you know your decision could change your life forever, you're going to be prepared for it. And I think that's you know as parents, and I think as as coaches or involved with any kids, you know, I think that's the best advice you can do is you you got to give them a good education, a good talking and communication about that, you know, if this comes across, um, you prepare them that, you know, they make the right choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we mentioned before, uh, you, you mentioned before a little bit about Perth um, having a team in the NRL. You know, with the 18th team coming up, they reckon 2025, depending on how the um, Dolphins go um, the next couple of years. Um, what are your thoughts on Perth joining the comp um, and also with that, um, joining up with the North Sydney Bears, because there's been talk about, um, you know, joining up with the North Sydney Bears. Um, I mean, because like me, me personally, I don't think, I don't see North Sydney or well, the NRL giving North Sydney a licence without Perth, uh, as there's too many yeah. teams in Sydney as it is. Mate, it's a, it's a weird one. It's a weird one because I, I've got a soft spot for any, any, any club like North Sydney, South Sydney, Balmain, West, you know. But in saying that, I, I personally, my own opinion is that Western Australia is such a big part of this country, and I think that Western Reds was was you know successful in in a lot of ways, but again, it was because people weren't willing to, to give it time, and you know look at look look at the Melbournes, look at the North Queensland, it's just nothing comes overnight, and I hope North, I hope the Dolphins. While, while I think that Brisbane's big enough to have another team, I think, you know, I hope that, you know, I can't see him being successful straight away. But I just, if they be competitive and people stick by him and, and people learn to, you know, pick him as that's their team, they support them and they get behind them and, yep. you know, they're going to make mistakes. But I think if they learn from a few of the other clubs that are making mistakes consistently that have been there for a lot longer, I think, you know, it, it, they'll go well. But... When I go back to Perth, I, 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 it's, it, it blows my mind of someone that's loved, loved rugby league all my life that they don't have a club in the NRL. I really don't understand it because uh, I often watch the, um, the games over there when it's on TV over here on, or in NITV or whenever it's on the paid TV, like the normal TV. And I, I, there's some talent there. I think that, I mean, I'd love to be over there coaching and, you know, and giving some, some you know, mentoring to some players over there. But I honestly think the place is, you know, it's crying out while it's very big in AFL, but I do believe there's always room for other sports and it just makes, uh, you know, a state more stronger, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I think that, you know, ideally, um, you know, hopefully they do get the next uh, one. I, I, I believe that um, Western Australia should get it, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. I know that, um, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a few more local clubs um, popping up here and there. Um, the club that I'm associated with, um, my local club, the Serpentine, um, Jared Ale Club, they've only been around for about three years now, four years. Um, there's And there's always clubs, new clubs popping up now, um, which is great to see. That means the interest is there. Um, there's young kids, uh, the mum and dads want to put their, their young kids in. You know, the mum and dads are coming over from Sydney and Brisbane and all these sort of places, New Zealand. Um, you know, and you got the islands as well, and they want to put their, their kids into rugby league, which is great. You know, for a while there, it was struggling to find. You had to drive a, a big distance to go to a club, but now with all these clubs popping up, it's it's making it, making it a lot easier for people to find. So the NRL obviously knows that there's an interest here because they've had you know state of origin here a couple of times um, before COVID. They were having a few of the club games over here as well. So, yeah, I mean, the NRL must know that they're, they're, there's huge interest here. So, yeah, we can only Definitely. wait, wait and, and see. And I think, I think, I think even saying that, like, you know what, um, it's, 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 the game's such a great game, rugby league. And I think, you know what, there's so much talent there in the kids and the grassroots. And, and you know, like, it changes people's lives. And, and I honestly believe that Western Australia deserves it. I really do. Um, in the past, I've been probably bit critical of some of the people they've thrown in the situations there but uh, it's just my personal opinion but I think that if they get some good people that you know they really need and they push for them 
I think that state can really produce some quality footballers in the next you know, 10 to 15, 20 years, you know. I yep. really do. I think, you know, look at Melbourne and look how many AFL teams and, you know, you've got two over there, mate. <laughs> and, yep. and look how much how much you can go. And I, and I think that, you know, with the way the game's gone, with all the multicultural, with all the islands, with all the PNG, with, with all these other countries are now coming in with the, okay, well, I mean, I'm not saying the World Cup has been great to watch, to be honest with you, but with all these interests of so many different um, nations, yeah. Um, and then and Western Australia's got plenty of them. And I think that it could really, really be successful if they do it right. And, and yeah. you know what? You're not always going to get things right. But if they if they learn from where they went before, I didn't think they were that far off the mark. I know yeah. they had to bring a lot of players over to start them off. But, again, you probably have to do that and mix them with, you know, like, you know, copy the Bellamy styles, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. you just got to – sometimes you've got to be successful to find your own path. and. And I, I really hope that they do, mate. I really do. Yeah. No, well, we, we all hope so over here, mate. So, yeah. Um, like, yeah, that's the whole point of me doing this sort of stuff is, um, you know, trying to promote the game, um, get more people involved, more people watching it, and um, hope the NRL sort of takes notice that, that yes, people like yourself, ex, ex NRL players, that want a team over here as well, it's not just the general public over here. Of course. So, um, but anyway, um, I want to get into a, a, a more personal subject with yourself, mate. Um, I just want to go into, have you been through a low point, you know, with depression and um, mental illness being a real big thing lately? You know, we um, the NRL lost, um, you know, one of their great coaches of um, Paul Green last year. You know, have you gone through something like that yourself? Um, you know, and if so, um, how did you get through it? Hey, well, I'll just reflect on Paul Green for a moment. I had the pleasure to play against Paul when he was Rothman's Bell at Cronulla, and I think he was a great player and also and had a few beers with Paul. He was a gentleman too, so um, very sad on his passing. I think at the end of the day that being a rugby league player, uh, and, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, starting my career at 17 and, you know, having the, you know, the fortune, the pleasures to play with the players that, you know, that have been in the game and have got great stature in the game. Um, it's it's hard because you're the emotional roller coaster and stuff like that. And when it's taken away from you, it's very tough. So I, I know personally a lot of players that, that are mates of mine and that they've done it tough over the last, you know, 10 years or 15 years. And and um, and it's not easy, but that's the same in, in anybody's life, you know, out there that's, you know, gets put off at work or, or go through some, you know, some ups and downs in their, their, their family life. And it's one of them things. But, you know, I'll, I'll go back to what we talked about a couple of times in this conversation, that having the right people around you and having the right communication, having the right people that are feeding good information and positive information is the key to it. Because, I mean, I have been down low and I've gone through, you know, um, you know, some highs and lows of my, you know, and I've, I'm very fortunate, you know, through all my ups and downs. I've, I've got five beautiful kids and I've got a beautiful wife that I've been married with for 25 years. And, you know, like yeah. there's a lot of ups. There's a lot of ups and they're, they're, they're the things that just keep make me realising and got lots of good friends. And that makes me realise that, you know, while I do make some poor choices, I think that, you know, I've got all these good people to come back to. And at the end of the day, I've got to just start having more conversations with these good people that have stuck by me for so long rather than the people that just want to be in your life for five minutes or because of who you were. And um, and I think that's that's the lesson I'm sort of trying to get to us to say to you that I've learned that, you know, people will pat you on the back and but when 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 it when push comes to shove, they're not there. So yeah. I just think that you've got to have important people around your life and, the, and, you know, it all starts with family and then your closest friends. And your friends are the ones that they care about you when you're making important decisions and will tell you straight. So... Yep. I think yep. that's 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 a, that's a key thing, and I think you know through my ups and downs, while I get through it, and I've been through a lot, is that because I I always seem to find back with the good people, and and that's that's my message to anyone that there is so many good people out there that do care, and if you have them in your life, you know they're better than the ones that are going to be in there for the wrong reasons, and um, unfortunately sometimes you know you know it's painful, but you've got to cut these people free and. Um, and you know what? If they haven't got your best thoughts and your best health and your best, you know, you, you, your family at heart, then they're not worth being in your life. So 
everybody comes sometimes in that crossroad and some people don't unfortunately and they take the next the option so i just i pray that um good communication and and people give you know the respect to their loved ones and the ones that care about you they're you know because they're there to help you and then they will turn your your mental health around if if you, if you give them the chance to be in your life and and listen you know you've got to listen to you know because they're saying it because they care and the the reason you know a lot of us that when we we go through what we do um is because we all, we've, we've had so many high you know moments in their lives and you want to have that adrenaline and that 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 feeling all the time and unfortunately it just doesn't happen and um it happens all around the world but it's just it's one of them things that unfortunately that so many you lose so many good people yeah exactly mate. absolutely and that is you know like i said before man, it's perfect advice um you know and i do appreciate you sharing your advice um you know with us um so we'll jump off that um that bit of a downer subject um what are you what are you doing um what are you doing in life these days mate what are you up to Mate, well, I'm um, I'm living up on the, on the, near the Gold Coast, and um, and um, I'm working for a building company, and I'm just driving a hoist at the moment, and I'm enjoying that, and just being around people, and um, you know, it's great to have people get in there and talk and reminisce the good times, and and you know, and um, yeah, hey, that's what it's all about, and um, just trying to do the right thing and take every day as it comes, you know, supporting the family and and watching them grow. They're all growing up, kids, and. Um, yeah. I'm going to be a grandfather in April, so I'm looking forward oh, to that. Wow. Congratulations. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I, I'm still want to look, keep involved in rugby league, and um, you never know, maybe some doors might open down the track. But um, at the moment, it's just trying to be work on myself and just being around my loved ones and my family, and and then they just enjoying every day. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, mate. Um, so you you were talking about your book before. Um, how far away are you from finishing it? And, um, you know, have you got a – has it got a title yet? It has got a title. It's um, called Off the Field. Yep. And, nice. um, yeah, and it's um, – look, I, I really think, you know, I wouldn't do it if, if I thought it was for any other reason that um, there's a lot of messages I want to get out there. Um, it's – I take responsibility, you know, in some hard conversations and um, – I'd also send a message out there that, you know, like life can be taken away from, from that quickly. And um, so if if you can give any advice, if, and as someone that's made a few mistakes, my advice is that, you know, you've got to just, you've got to take every day as it comes, set goals, be positive. Um, you're going to have shit days and that's just the way it is. But, you know, they don't last if you just keep working on the same fundamentals of just being around good people and, 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 and being grateful for the little things and, um and when you get the big things, and then it's a bonus. So, um, and then it's just, it's just like over the years, like it's well, twelve years of of NRL and and the stories and the people I met, and yeah. and you know, there's some, you know, there's some, there's some dampenings, you know, there's some stories about the people wouldn't know, and how they do it to downgrade downgrade people, but but I think the truth needs to be told sometimes in scenarios, because as a player. You know, you're there to play on the football field and for the 80 minutes you can do your best work on the football field. But if you're off the field and you make a mistake, there, there could be could be situ, situ, situations around it um, without blaming anyone for your actions. But clubs these days, you know, it's the game yeah. moves in so many different way, ways and directions that, you know, and, and when, when, you, when you talk about some of the things that's happened over the years, I think that, you know, they're talking points. And I think at the end of the day, some people need to be reminded of um, their roles. And, and you know what, at the end of the day, they don't get accountable for it because yep. it's easy just to sack a player and another player will come through. And that, that's, that is so beat if that's the way the club survives. But, but I don't believe that's in the best interest of the next person coming through. Let's stop someone making the same mistake someone else does yep. and make it, making better choices and, um, and help them and help them. Don't say you can help them and don't help them because it looks good and sells a paper that you're going to be there and with your label and say, yeah, we're going to do that. Help yeah. to help help them, you know. And, I, and, I, and I'm not feeling sorry for myself at all, but I know other players and I've talked to other players and I know other scenarios. And we all know publicly, and I'm willing to say it, that some of the best players in the game have always been protected by the game. But other players that mightn't be that stature of the, of the game 
they get chewed up and spat out because they're no different. They've got arms, legs, and they're human beings. They should be treated the same way, and that sends a better message for every kid that comes through that they're going to be protected and they're going to be helped and they're going to give an opportunity that they want to communicate if they're down. You know, we have these days, are you okay? It gives them more encouragement to talk up if they've got issues, whether it be gambling, drinking, drugs, whatever it may be, if if they see that this is the way it is. If they see that one person gets protected but other people get spat out, that they're going to be too scared. They're going to keep it a secret. They're not going to talk about it. They're going to keep They're going to keep making the same mistakes because they feel like they're not getting help. So who's sending the wrong message here? The person that's making the mistake or the people that are looking after the game, their own interest? Yeah, For exactly. me, I think that I think that's what a lot of the book's going to come out and say. And it's also going to tell some good stories. It's going to be good laughs. There's some um, characters that I've, you know, met across the years and I just tell them why they're, they're, they're special to me or, or what have you. And um, and there's some run-ins with individuals and, and I think, you know, it's my chance to speak my mind. I mean, I'm not making a book to downgrade anyone or to put myself up any higher. I just think that it's been a great story. It's been a great venture. And... Um, while, you know, I'll, I'll re, re, recap on some low, low lives, low things that happened in my life also. There's plenty of good things and um, and there's some funny stories there and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to um, getting out there. So, But it's only in the early stages at the moment. Um, I'm meeting with um, a couple of people in the near future. Uh, Matty Nable, the actor, yep. who I played with at South, some good friends with his brothers. Um, he's helping me out with a publisher. So, uh, yeah, we're just... We're just slowly, um, you know, when I had a bit of time away, I, I, I wrote a lot of it. Uh, I spoke to a lot of people about their thoughts about how I was going to say things and I don't want to lose friends about it, but I just, but also I don't want to, don't want to write a book if it's fake. I want to be able to say the raw. And yeah. I really think that, you know, like to the everyday person that wants to read a book about someone that's 100% Aussie and, and you know, he's a bit of larrikin, but the thing is, at the end of the day, he's, um, it's, he's brutally honest and wears his heart in his sleeve. And I think it's going to be a really good read. And I think that, you know, people will see a different side to myself, you know. Yep. And um, I think that, you know what, it could also it could also help a lot of people too that, you know, that one conversation will say, well, did you know about this? And then they might talk about it. And, then, and if we get them talking, mate, then you know what, the book's a winner. That's it, mate. Absolutely. I mean, I, from what you're saying about the book, mate, I can't wait to read it. Um, as soon as it comes out, mate, you'll have to let me know so I can buy a copy. Um, Not a problem, but, mate. mate that'll be, be a hell of a read, mate. So um, that's all I've got for you, mate. Um, have you got anything to say to the fans that you got over here in Perth, in Western Australia? No, I just think I, I, I just, you know, I think it's a great place, Perth. I've been there many times. I've had some great, great friends over there and, um, beautiful part of the world and uh, I just think that you know what if, if if things work out the way I would like to see it I really think they deserve a team and and let's pray that it happens and um you never know you know might even get a coaching give over there one day that's it mate absolutely we're well, more than welcome down to that club mate anytime you come over um but if you do ever come back over uh to Perth mate let me know uh, we'll catch up for a coffee or something and um go out to a lunch or whatever but Sounds um great mate Craig Field, thank you for joining me on NRL Fans WA. I really appreciate you giving me your time. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. God bless. Thanks, mate. See you, bud.